There has long been established in Philadelphia an extremely interesting institution, the University Museum of the University of Pennsylvania. There are, of course, in America hundreds of museums, some devoted to art or history, others to natural sciences, or to mechanical and industrial achievements. Yet none has the exact scope and aim of the University Museum. It is dedicated to the recreation of history, that is, to rebuilding the story of man's slow rise from the most primitive states to the heights of the great civilizations. In this cause, for the past 50 years, the University Museum has dispatched more than 100 scientific expeditions to every quarter of the globe, to deserts, to jungles, and scores of distinguished scientists have excavated the sites of ancient hearths and of long abandoned towns or have assembled invaluable collections and data among living primitive peoples. The purpose of this motion picture is to tell the absorbing story that lies behind the archaeological work of the museum, the constant quest in the ancient earth for the evidence of man's past, and to illustrate the many and varied steps that bring the tangible objects to the museum and make them accessible for study, instruction, and appreciation, and for scientific usefulness. Since its foundation, the University Museum has been particularly identified with archaeological research in the ancient East and in those lands familiar to us from the Bible. Its very first undertaking was to uncover the extensive remains of the buried city of Nippur in Babylonia. The rich results of the Nippur expedition encouraged the extension of the museum's interest to other parts of the ancient East. Later, its collections were enlarged to include India, Central Asia, and the Far East, those from China being of particular significance. Research both of the buried past and the primitive living cultures was in due course extended to Africa and the islands of the South Seas. Work, too, was early initiated and collections assembled on our own hemisphere, ranging from the Arctic regions and Alaska, from the Indians of the United States and Canada, from the ancient civilizations of Central America and Mexico, even to the countries and long forgotten cultures of South America. To many out of the way places the museum's workers have penetrated, to oriental cities teeming with native life. to civilized areas of the tropics and to virtually unexplored regions of palm and pine. The museum's Tepe Hisar expedition provides a typical archaeological site to illustrate the varied tasks that confront the archaeologist in the field. There is first the long ocean journey. From the coast of Asia Minor, the personnel of the expedition passes through capitals long familiar in writings that range from the Bible to the Arabian Nights. Over desert track and high mountain pass to reach its archaeological objective, Tepe Hisar, ancient town site near Damgan in northern Persia, modern Iran. No matter where the excavations are conducted, if on a large scale, much reliance must be placed upon skilled and unskilled native workmen. The nature of the work and the distance of the site eliminates the use of modern digging equipment and the workers use only the most primitive implements. Yet no scientific device to obtain records of the utmost accuracy is overlooked. Photography naturally plays a very vital part in all phases of field work. The surveyor, too, is dependent upon for accurate maps. And before any spade work starts, the site is laid off in squares like a grid. Certain of these squares are selected for excavation. This grid is then reproduced by stakes and lines on the surface of the ground, and excavations are started within the limits of various squares and carried down to virgin soil, revealing the successive levels of ancient occupation. Careful recording ensures that the exact position of any object in relation to other objects is fixed with the record. Such buildings have all too often been swept bare of any valuables when they were abandoned by their owners, but occasionally things of artistic merit were buried and forgotten. 
Here we see, for instance, a little alabaster statuette of a bearded cow brought up after 50 centuries underground. When the mud incrustation is brushed off, it is revealed as fresh and as beautiful as on the day it was buried. Most of the pottery vessels that come to light have been crushed by the weight of the overlying earth. These are put together in a preliminary manner at field headquarters, since it is important for the excavator to have a general idea of their shapes, which are valuable for dating. Since pottery is the most indestructible material made by early man, it is for the archaeologist the most valuable guide. A host of other objects in stone and metal, seals, beads, tools, and other sorts of ornaments are gathered from each test pit and after being registered are set out on the shelves of the field storerooms. More important ones are, however, photographed as soon as they come in from the excavations. Such photographs are sent back to the museum for release to the papers and magazines. Special problems arise when skeleton material is found. Only the most skilled workers are entrusted with the task of uncovering the human burials that are frequently encountered. The bones have become extremely fragile due to long burial, and only a carefully handled knife can remove the encrusted earth without damage. Upon the care with which the skeletons are removed depends a large part of the scientific evidence to be gained, since their measurements may establish racial types. In the course of the Tepe Hisar expedition, one grave of particular interest was discovered and it was decided to remove it intact in order to reproduce it exactly at home in the museum. It was the grave of the warrior, and all the bones as well as the objects bared with him are here seen being meticulously uncovered by the most proficient native workmen of the expedition. Tedious work to brush off and lift intact and record the position of every tiny bone and object, but a task that repays the effort when the grave is reassembled in the museum. The warrior apparently died in combat, for his skull was found severely fractured. His bronze helmet shows a hole corresponding to that in the skull, and indicating that he had probably donned it during the battle in which he fell. Objects carved from alabaster were found with him, all designed without doubt for the use of his spirit in the afterworld. We have, however, no inkling of the religion of this remote race to which the warrior belonged, nor shall we have until further evidence comes to light. As the season for excavating draws to a close and before the rain set in, the material assigned to the museum is boxed for shipment to Philadelphia. The government usually assigns one half of all finds to the institution supporting the expedition, one half for itself. Complete records of all finds are made, however, and the final disposition of each piece, whether to Philadelphia or Iran, is noted on the books of the expedition. boat bearing the cases at length reaches America, and the boxes are unloaded. The long journey by sea and land is almost ended. 